uh, Dr. Cheryl Savage. Unmute there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. It's so ha I'm so happy to be here again. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for all the hard work uh, that you do to put this together. <clears throat> I'm going to read new work today, except for one poem. Um, this is, um, it's Wolf Song. It was that first clear note we heard under the stars, the night singers, the ones who taught us call and response, the power of voices and light layered harmony. They throw their heads back in song, throats open, eyes closed. We throw our heads back in ecstasy or grief, our souls bare. So uh, I live in senior housing and um, they banned, we ha all had bird feeders here. They've had bird feeders here for 30 years and suddenly a couple of years ago, they stopped. They told us we could no longer have them. So this is um, concerning the ban on bird feeders. She says a woman complained there are so many birds she's afraid to walk on the sidewalk. Ostriches, perhaps, not likely. Pigeons? No, we are in the country surrounded by forest. I imagine a sidewalk filled with blue jays, cardinals, red-winged blackbirds. Maybe the chickadees are flitting from one place to another, the little upside-down birds hanging onto a nearby pole with three kinds of woodpeckers. Maybe there are goldfinches eating the down of dandelions alongside the red house finches. Maybe there's a dipped in raspberry juice purple finch among them. Now I can hear robins, the sweet voices of Carolina wrens and song sparrows. Morning doves rise from the grass, their wings whistling. Flickers show their golden breasts, and above us, the red-tailed hawk circles, ready to dive. Maybe if she'll pick off that woman who's afraid of birds, the one who's shrunk to the size of her own fear. Maybe the bluebirds will sing the song of happiness, or maybe they are huddling together on a platform feeder in a winter storm, fighting off contenders. See the starlings in their speckled winter robes. They come from away, but they are here now, painting the sky with dance. Sorry. Look closely at the little gray birds, the juncos with their pink bills and white breasts, the tufted titmouse with its crest and orange sides. The great blue heron flies towards the swamp, its legs trailing behind, and at the river, an osprey dives for fish in front of my eyes as I stand on a rock mid-river. At dusk, I hear the coco coco of the barred owl, the chip chip of a cardinal looking for its last meal of the day. When I get home, they've stolen our bird feeders. This is called morning. It was a moment of perfect beauty. He with his arms out to his sides, shoulders dropped forward, elbows up, palms back, demonstrating the needle shaped dive of the bird just before it hits water. His coffee forgotten on the table before him. I've been doing a series of poems from the tarot. Um, the tarot has been important to me uh, for most of my adult life. Um, and if you know, don't know, there's two parts of the tarot. There's the major arcana, which is sort of a group of archetypal uh, images. And then um, the four suits that are related to the four suits we have in cards now. So I'm going to, um, I'm just gonna read through them. I'm not gonna really talk too much in between. Magician. This is from the Animal Lords Tarot. What is he doing this fox playing the shell game? One hand lifted to reveal a stone, the other hand ready to mix it up. He's working hard to con this red bird looking on, this mouse in red hat and brown jacket, paws crossed behind his back. There are better things to do on this huge mushroom he's using for a table. Where are his tools? There are medicine plants all around. He hasn't figured out what real magic is. The Hermit from the Golden Tarot. He is standing in a forest, his left hand caressing the head of the fawn standing next to him. 
A small gray cat is on the path to his right, her paw up, ears back, listening. The lantern he holds is not much higher than his waist. He doesn't need to seek anything in these woods. Strength from the Wonderland Tarot. She never knew she could do this, hold a frightened fawn in her arms so it can't run into the arms of danger. It is deep night and they're on a path where anyone could find them. Stay quiet, she says, then leap into the blue trees. They will weave the dark around you. The devil from the Fay Tarot. He wears the face of an animal, this one who devours forests. His body is a flame. He should have been put to sleep like those boulders who used to be men. The more he eats, the hungrier he gets. He can't eat fast enough. After this, there's another something to be devoured, a forest, a continent, an ocean, a planet. This one is called the star. And I think of this actually, there's this moment when all of a sudden you realize um, you have that moment where everything is beautiful and, and together and you have like this little, you have this little epiphany of how everything is uh, filled with mystery. The star from the Fay Tarot. Stars surround her like swirling flakes of snow falling from the indigo sky. Head thrown back, she leans into them, eyes closed. One arm reaches for a railing to anchor her. This is not the lover she expected when she walked bare-breasted onto the balcony. I was, I've been thinking a lot about photosynthesis. It sounds weird working on the tarot. I've been thinking a lot about photosynthesis and how it is the basis of everything. Green plants, you know, are magically magically soak up the sun and turn it into food, make everything on the planet, all other life on the planet possible, and incidentally create and, and sustain our atmosphere. Um, but it starts here, it starts with the sun. And this is, um, I was hoping to catch a little bit of that in this one. It's from the Anna Kay Tarot. The sun, this is all there is sun above and sunflowers below, and a yellow field with a thin stream trickling through it. There are tiny houses on the yellow hills. The sunflowers keep opening and opening. The lovers is, you know, people tend to think of the lovers cards as literally just being about lovers. It's often thought about as a marriage card, um, but it's also about choice and um, the choices we make. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, whether we choose only the human <clears throat> or whether we see beyond that. So this is the lovers from the chrysalis terror. If we marry beneath this old tree with its gnarled roots, purple in the dusk, it is not just each other we choose. All these relatives, deer, owl, rabbit, and doves, cat, sheep, and horse, even this old man risen from the grass, all involved in this marriage. The sun and moon bear witness. We consider our choice, await the kiss. I've thought also about um, the ways that we relate and how important it is to to thank and honor. Um, and um, I, I saw this card and it reminded me of that. It reminded me of ceremony. So this is Queen of Cups. <clears throat> She's come down to the sandy shore dressed in the colors of sea. She's carefully braided her hair with blue ribbons, tied her white kerchief beneath her chin, set her silver crown on top. She stands next to the breaking waves, her blue cape trimmed in white. Beside the rocky cliff, she raises a cup to sea and sky. And I want to end with this one. 
This actually is not a new one. This is an old one, um, but it's almost the right time of year to be reading it. Um, it's called Equinox, the Goldfinch. It is as if he had swallowed the sun, which slept the winter inside him until he forgot what it was like to live in warmth and golden. But his body has the knack of timing. For weeks now, golden feathers have appeared among the gray and khaki brown. Now his back is mottled with ice flows, drifting in water that is not blue, but shining purest yellow. He rides upon the cusp of winter and he is full of sun. It is too much for him to bear. His throat swells with it and he pushes the sun out into the air where it turns immediately to song. The notes fall back to him and he tries again, head back, throwing the sun into the air and it returns to him and yet again and again, there is no end to this light that is filling him. It is the sun, he has become the sun. His song shimmers with light and his body blossoms into yellow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl, that was great. Uh, our next poet is Susan Glass. Thank you. And Cheryl, that last poem just set my whole heart singing. It's so full of synesthesia. That is the best description of a singing goldfinch and how the sound is light and the light is sound that I have ever known. Um, birds are my first language. So that was such a gift. Uh, thank you. And I want to thank Liz and um, everyone for organizing this lovely festival. I'm going to begin this morning by sharing uh, the two poems that appear in the Honoring Nature anthology of mine, and then I'll share some from my uh, forthcoming chapbook being published by Slate Roof Press. This first poem is called A Small Healing. Ada's spine is a notched cane where recurring pains deliver stings, pinched nerves to the brain. The postures of onset blindness, looking always down at first and then always up toward daylight, toward voices, have sculpted her carriage. So too the loss of name to marriage. Oh, to breathe, to be March grass, mustard scent. She rises in the clear dawn and walks. Horses wait for her, nestled in the curve of a half suburban road. She smells them first, their molasses breath, their wool musk coats, now winter shed. Appaloosa, Rhone, Palomino, Bay. She approaches, their skins wriggle and their ears gliding forward to catch her steps are wreathed in dew. For much of this past night, they have stayed awake, quickened by apricot blossoms and frog chorus. She imagines their conversation, stories of space before fence and bridal, before myth even, thinks too of their sleepwalker dreams, amblings, alder lust, envies them, regrets career and mortgage, the swaddling walls that hold her life. The Morgan Bay approaches first. She's a filly still and Ada, hearing the bamboo jointed shamble of long boned knees, feels again the gentlest pressure of thigh against flank. A demure head stretches over braided wire, bobs the long nose, pole, forelock, invites a scratch. Ada obliges, offers carrots too as the others sidle close, buzz their lips, swat each other with broomstraw tails. On tiptoe, Ada stretches, loses her face in the feral mane, inhales milk warm new filly breath, feels the new girl, clean laundered and t-shirt fresh, leaping straight backed and lithe from saddle to earth. And this next uh, poem is called Writing Santa Clara Valley and Santa Clara Valley was the Spanish nomenclature for Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley does not roll off the tongue. There is probably an Ohlone native nomenclature that, of which I am unaware, um, but, but this is the closest I can come at the moment to where I grew up and what is so much my homeland, writing Santa Clara Valley. I wish my words were acorns, my lines, stems, and branches, my taproot, 
root this whole line of foothills. I hope for poems made of sycamore leaves whose edges curl a warning in drought. I want corrugated stanzas I can scratch my back against, stanzas too wide to reach arms around. I need lyrics that don't fear coyote scat or a great horned owl's silent wing. I believe in scrub jay voices raking the undergrowth and in the assonance of autumn water falling. I yearn for poems whose downed limbs bruise my shins as I leap across streams and sting my nose with tarweed scent. It is never enough to write or say or remember quail. A poem must be the line of fledglings stepping single file along the rancher's fence or pip, 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 pipping in the chaparral. Um, I'd like to share now the, the title poem uh, from my uh, chapbook that will be released from Slate Roof Press later this, uh, this spring. And a big shout out to my colleagues here. I love you and love working with you. Uh, this poem is called The Wild Language of Deer. The deer appears in my family room and I throw down every myth I've ever read. Great stags in the Danish king's forest, northern stars flickering in their antlers, Artemis buck avenged, iris fairies milking hinds. This doze, doze bones are harder than the maple piano. Her hooves puncture the oak floor, cut jagged braille stanzas to the kitchen's rim. Her knees dispose of chairs, her shoulders thrust musky scented into the breakfast nook and the head mounted over the fireplace is like any face emerging from a dream that bewilders that asks, what is this place? The body is a dark space under basement stairs where we flatten together on our bellies. I pull wet sentences from the clay of her flanks. They smell like fermented potatoes. They are the mute story I'm telling of her furious severed head. They are poems that will never domesticate, that welcome this wild language back into my home. Uh, this is a, a, a poem about music, um, which it, it's about human music, but it's also about the way in which human music and nature's music um, can braid together. And uh, this is called Quarreling with the Flute. It's also about the bummer of getting older and discovering that you can't play your instrument to do the things you used to do as well as you used to. So a little bit of a groan and complaint here too. Quarreling with a flute. I played my first solo at 14, my sister at the piano whispering, breathe, slow, slower, rest. I was a girl, a spry and quivering column of air. If I'd been born of reed or wood, if I'd persuaded the air to pass my voice on, in wild smoke, a bamboo song stripped from trees, burned from the inside out, cleaving dark sound into light. Maybe then my lips would kiss the warm blowhole instead of clenched smiling into an embouchure. I have inhaled enough scales today to blow the blasted circles of fifths and fourths through 18 universes. It's supposed to work, this climbing from tonic to dominant, this tire leaking, for as many counts as I can bear till my stomach lies flat against my spine. Foolish to dream that Debussy's syrinx is a melody I breathe from thought with no metallic clicks. I groom my flute as I might a horse, swabbing and dabbing until the musk of my finger marks vanishes and she is all silvery hope again. We don't speak for hours and I go to bed angry. I dream my flute has been washed out to sea and poises on a tide pool's edge just above salt. It seems centuries before I reach her. And when I do, she is a woman trailing long hair and skirts in the water. Um, and here's another music piece. It, it also um, is a little nod to my, my previous guide dog, Zeus. A cellist brings me autumn. Her window stand open and a Zeus and I stroll past a buzzing warm legato curves 
from bow to string to air to ear. Zeus cocks his head and lemon scented notes wing toward his nose. He wags. The cellist changes tunes, this one unstudied, a child's back to school penmanship. Her low notes sigh that autumn will be a long climb and warmth, a thing we coax from cupped hands. And the last poem I'm going to read today is called Dusk Waking. I stand near a mounted horsewoman who passes me braided reins. There are differences, she says, between Western and English riding. For English, a structured gait and timing are everything. For Western, it's space you need and wide sounds and years you can't predict. I accept the offered reins and mount, not her horse, but the sorrel mare beside it. We ease our sand shod way under pepper trees, then out into the open shadow tracks. The long dusk our waking is, we call it future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, that was beautiful. Uh, our next reader is Janet McFadden. Thanks, Liz, for, for having me here. This has been such a rich experience hearing Cheryl and Susan, and I'm looking forward to hearing everybody else. Um, just a very quick introduction to the four Slate Roof Press poets who are reading here today, the first of which was Susan, and then myself, and then Anna M. Warwick and Richard Woolman. Um, we make these just beautiful um, letter, well, they have letterpress covers, these chapbooks, um, we are a collaborative press that's been around since um, 2006, I think. And um, Susan's book is coming out later this spring and Richard's book will be coming out in um, following Susan's and Anna and I both have our books out. So I'll be reading um, five poems, three of which are in the anthology Honoring Nature, which I'm delighted about. Um, and for the most part, they take place in this area of Western Massachusetts that I call my home that I'm not positive, but I think this is Nipmuc land. Um, maybe Patumquap, I can't pronounce it, I'm so sorry. Patumquap land. So this first poem uh, started with an encounter with a squirrel who was as surprised as we were, I guess. 13 lines tied to the wind the red squirrel runs right towards us, then straight up a tree. How surprised he is. How strange to stand in the middle of a wood, not knowing what we are. The wind will not stop blowing. It is not put off by the gibber of news. It is not tied to a prophet. It is simply unspooling. I could mimic it, be bird song or the red hurricane of fur. When I say wind, I really mean voices. I really mean the yellow death caps rising out a leaf meal. I'm asking you to listen. I'm asking to see how the leaves underfoot lay down their bodies as a sentence. I try to read, but I understand only what I already know. Lines of broken sticks, abandoned nests, the wind tells us to keep moving, set intention aside, do what we have to do. Birds also singing in the last fused hours of daylight. And um, this next poem. So there is a, um, an amazing natural courtyard, I guess I would call it, that's formed of these gigantic ledges in North Leverett just called pig pen ledges because apparently somebody, I think probably in the 19th century kept their hogs there because it's pretty enclosed and you can get in and out of it. But so um, it's a gorgeous place. Whoop. As if among ancient ruined temples, roots spill from the lip of a great courtyard formed of enormous outcrops, home to shag bark hickory, mountain laurel, lichen, fern. 
trees, the first inhabitants with lightning bolt branches, consciousness fixed in space. Windows torn from the walls, wind sweeping from room to room, wind that takes my breath away, woods breathing in, sighing out. Leaves, fro <laughs> Leaves float in front of our eyes as if on water, extend down as far as we can see into the shadows, schools of fish, trees gently waving below us like kelp, the great sheer sided sea ledges studded with cords. A breeze slides lightly across a face. It could be rock, it could be yours. And then out in Ashfield, Mass, I spent a week there. Um, and there is a, um, while, well, it's a conservation area called um, Bear Swamp, which is a beautiful little area. And I wrote a sequence of these little tiny little poems. I usually write long poems. These are little tiny things. So I call them poemlets. And I start with two short ones about um, trees in relationship. They must love each other to be so entwined, trees whose roots embrace muscular as pythons. Straight trunk with a seam stitched up its side and fused to its root the stub of a hollowed out stump, brother long dead, the scar still alive. Cut copper birch sprouts a dozen small shoots rooted in rock on the side of an outcrop, stubborn as anything that walks this earth. Gold beech, yellow birch, a pond mirroring a mackerel sky that mirrors the disk of water, the life of fish. The mind turns inward. The voice turns inward. I am here, not there. This is how it is. And the last little poemlet. I scrunch through leaf fall to a sheer cliff face, a peeling lichen, intaglio of root and branch, overlooking a cleft, running down to a bowl of a marsh. A chipmunk was noisy as I, a gray squirrel also. Nothing could move without first announcing itself. I heard footsteps of something, upsweep of energy, wind coming in, leaves giving voice in a single breath. And then, okay, change of landscape down to Cape Cod in Provincetown, where I'm always in love with all the salt rack trees with all their little gnarly branches. So this is called scrub oak pitch pine. Let me be so alive as these desiccated leaves, moving all their lives from mold to salt, wind to wind, and look, a pitch pine's bow constrictored limbs drape over us, wrap around whatever they claim, air and its blueness, arthritic fingered oaks all unnoticed until we sit on this split rail fence grayed out from salt and moisture, we are of this world, fashioned of salt and breath. May we be as patient as this old one next to me, whose lower branches grip its spent bleached cones, breathed with lichen, also gray, a smoky pitch pine, gray thumbed, gray eared, listening with quiet memory. And the last poem, back to Ashfield in uh, Western Mass here at a place called Chapel Falls, um, where I spent probably three or four hours sitting because my husband's a photographer and he takes a long time. And I was just writing about the trees and the falls and the stream. And the trees seemed like figures. And so that's what I wrote, but you know, it didn't seem really accurate. It seemed kind of facile until it suddenly came to me that the trees 
not only kind of looked like fountains, but were in actuality fountains. So um, this poem is called Cascade. Like tangled hair over stone, roots hold trees against a stream. The current loosens its gorgeous fall, braids and unbraids against the rock, while roots draw water to the crown, a fountain and a glory. The falls pull water downward from their spring. The spring rises and overflows. Leaves push outward the weeping, wait a minute, I messed up. The trees pull water downward from their spring. The spring rises and overflows. Leaves push outwards the weeping willow greens. Cascades swell with rain and spill their shimmering ringlets down, fall and fall all summer long and until trees let down their hair and leaves are loosed, lips call sap back to the earth and all stands dark and silent. Fro frost grows, the current swirls and slows under a lacy ice, but does not stop. A tree's heart does not freeze in its quiet sleep. So close and so far under, I lay my hand on root. I dip my hand in water and the sap wells up. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. That was beautiful. Uh, our next reader is Anna Warwick. Hello, uh, and I would also like to thank you, Liz, and the um, speakers who are giving of their time so that we can create community and recognize in our hearts what, how important nature is and how important we are to each other in nature. Uh, I'm going to read five poems. They're all about landscape and being human in landscape, although the salmon appear in the middle there. The first are three short poems from a calendar. Uh, so I'll just read three months. Spring snow, April. Spring snow covers the lilacs. Snow storms through miles and miles. As the heart slowly learns to bear, I travel drift, take root in wind, and twist, anticipating questions too slight to hold. I draw cold lace across landscapes and put them behind me. May. It starts with a rainstorm. I think of rain-soaked trees then of sap, and sap becomes flowers, blossoms on the branch, and then fruit hanging, not yet devoured, apples. And then I think of peaches, nectar in a taut skinned sphere, colored like sunset or sunrise. And I feel as I hold the fruit in my hand and bite, and the juice runs over my fingers and the flesh lolls on my tongue, that time can go on forever. And it does. Lake Champlain, June. Swimming with the mountains on my right, I have cause for alarm. They loom, they recede back from the water's edge. Their reflections reach out to me. He says he loves me. I have been known to believe in love. I try to write his name and the pen writes mountains and Mountains and mountains. This poem is in uh, the 
anthology, which I'm, I can't wait to get my hands on it because I'd love to read what everyone else has written. Thank you so much to um, Paul and Liz and, uh, and uh, all, it was uh, everyone involved in doing the book. I know there's one other name I'm blanking here, Salmon. The salmon go all the way upstream. The fish gather in the cold ocean, breathe water, eat other fish. They in turn are eaten. What do they know? They know they are salmon and where they were born. They gather in the cold ocean and when it is their turn to die, when it is their turn to return, they know what to do. They remember where they need to go and they go. The female salmon stop roaming the ocean, eating other fish. They leave the endless deep and turn toward land to find the river mouth that spit them forth. They enter the mouth, go up river. The female salmon travel together the male salmon leave the cold ocean, the eating of other fish. They seek the mouth that spit them forth from the land's constriction and enter. They go back guided by the memory. They go to make the memory continue in their way. They go to make the salmon continue in the old way. They swim up river leap the falls, push between rocks against water to the shallows where they were born. They go to the heart of the land. They meet and agree. The female waves her body and lays her eggs and moves off. The male waves his body, sprays his seeds and moves off. Then the female and male salmon die. In the shallows, having given birth to eggs and seeds, a promise to their memories, they die. The salmon go all the way upstream. The salmon go all the way to death. And the last poem here um, is another landscape poem uh, with a human being going through it. On the road. The gulls catch thermal currents above the interstate, flapping their wings and half circling in a glide that intersects the line of cars. You keep driving, and the gulls are behind you now. What can you do? You are going to visit relatives four hours away at 65 miles per hour, a common speed. You cast your body forward into your life, your obligations. The road crosses the bones of an old orchard as on either side, a few bent trees dotted with white blossoms stand out of time. The pine trees, long limbs reach toward the car, but you cannot stop. Someone has called to you on the telephone, signaled across these same miles. You've heard them say, come being human, and they would do as much for you, you come. You cast your life forward into your life. And those you love, women and men, stand at either end of your journey with their arms waving, saying, thank you, thank you, while you wonder, is it enough? This is the nature of the inner life, wondering while the body goes on. Inside, 
you cast yourself forward into those things you presume to carry you forward. First, that this urge to come together is enough or nearly enough, enough for this life, a belief like the speed limit, right for a time, though changeable, to take your mind off the driving, you glance to either side of the road. Look, there's a stream and someone stands and casts for the trout circling under the water, waiting to slip the bait quickly off the hook or to die. And now you are past that too. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. It's great to hear that salmon poem out loud. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Richard Woolman. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you, Liz, for doing everything you've done to bring everyone together. It's deeply appreciated. And thank you to my, um, my fellow panelists. What a pleasure to be able to read alongside you and all your lovely poetry. Um, First time I've ever heard you read, Susan. What a pleasure. I'm gonna read a few poems from um, my last book, which was called Evidence of Things Seen. Uh, and then, I'm, then I'll finish with a couple from, uh, a few from the book coming out with Slate Roof after Susan's lovely book. Um, and that one's called Changeable Gods. Okay, but this one, this first one's called Mythology. When Orion moves in December, just outside the mudroom, I lose interest in the moon, which hangs there and cannot compare with the strong belt of stars, the broad sword suspended. But what gets me more are his arms and legs extended, splayed, not like a hunter, more like the hunted, whose likeness to his prey is seen by any eyes that know our oldest witness. This next one's called um, Better Light. And you could say it, it's, the, it's a way of writing about nature that kind of admits uh, how we don't always chime with it right? or how I don't. Um, better Light. The light was in and out of the clouds then nudged away for good. Was it nighttime? My son was confused. My mother called on a cell phone wanting to describe a sunset the color of Florida. A dull urge made me go outside to hack and hack away at a defenseless shrub. I would thought to shape it, make it round again. The branches pointed at me when there were no leaves left to speak of. Inside, my son stuttered, Something about the dog wasn't right. She didn't flinch when I touched her. Was it possible in this light that she was simply resting on the rug? Sometime later, scattered pieces interlocked, each part the blueprint of a better truth seen in a better light, a fiction we need, at least for the hours before light outside appears to make the changes on its own. I was supposed to set my timer and I forgot. This one's called uh, The Gardener. A um, bunch of poems in this book from a, from a time I was uh, an extended stay in, in Provence and got really fascinated with how little there was evidence of any Jewish life there since they were expelled in late 14th century. Uh, but then I started to find stuff too. This one's called The Gardener. On mild days, the ailing cypress in Banu curled like a plume against the mountain. The wind made sounds of acceptance. The mountain barely moved. His mind took in the same light that released rigid crows from Van Gogh's eyes. 
when the Mistral started to blow back the ranks of trees and reveal the roots and aries, hollows, lairs, the fallen boughs of the shivering mountain, it sang in his limbs, it sang in his lover's thighs. It's called Paper in Autumn. And it was inspired by the receipt my receipt about 10, uh, no, maybe about 20 years ago, huh? uh, of some letters from my ex-wife's family had given to me because they discovered that they, that they had relatives that they thought were all dead for all these years uh, in the Holocaust, but that a great deal of the family did survive and they reunited and they gave the American side all these letters that were sent back and forth in uh, with the European relatives to people in the camps. There was very fluid communication that we, I think we don't always know about. Um, and then there was what stuck, what got me was there's this guy, Uncle Armin, who apparently had the habit of escaping from the concentration camps and had done so several times. Those fences were pretty porous. Most people didn't go anywhere because there was nowhere safe to go. Um, but I was intrigued by this Armin who um, could get himself out and then he would go to the woods. So this is called Paper in Autumn. Each time the brigands arrive to herd them onto the airless trains to Theresien, Zelina, finally to Poland, Armin fled to the grove. No camp could contain him, not until he met that woman from Tranchain who gave him a beautiful boy. Then the wood lost its hold on him, his anonymity gone. The trees turned to paper, yellowing before his eyes. All of them inscribed with his name, rooted in the certainty of the earth. He tried to bury himself in the grass, to rub the sweet, dark dirt on his skin. Our family was fed to an open fire. Armin left the grove in autumn to join the transport with his wife and his child. The sweet smell of her skin captured him, the boy's soft hair. I tell you, he was the only one whose death was not witnessed. We wait for news. No one, belie no one believed the flames would reach him. Nothing was written. Okay, I'm going to switch over. These, so this, this book for Slate Roof Press, which I'm so proud to, to, to be a member of, um, was start their love poems that begin for 40 mornings in a row, where I get up very early and, and in the top room where my art studio is and look at the sky and then wrote an email a poem in an email to the beloved and did it for 40 days. So that's, that's what, so they're not titled, it's a sequence and I'm just gonna read a few of them. Um, Ultramarine at its darkest point, but not so dark that black trees can't be seen. And soon each branch and leaf slick from the rain will have itself lined against the sky. The black cows grazing the pasture along Scotland Road don't mind the water on their thick hides. They don't have minds affected by weather. Hooves in the mud and all that spatter won't stop a cow from reaching down and eating the delicious grass. It won't stop anyone who knows that rain is allowed to be rain and loves it for being so. Like I love the furrowed field of your brow when a storm implants itself there because it needs a place to go before it clears. Thank you, Richard. Do you have uh, one minute left? Okay, thank you. Uh, this, this, this is uh, my last one. I've formed storms more than once, convinced that love could never be enough to weather all that must be weathered if we are to last another morning. In the woods today, the trees were russet. Everything became red. And for once, 
Neither calm nor storm could take you away from me. There was no one for miles with an opinion of us beneath the blue permeated with green, a green I'd never known, the green of lichen on brick, of leaves impressed in mud, green that could keep storms away for days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful poems. Our last reader is Leo Wang. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and again, thanks to everyone involved with the, the festival. Um, so I have a few poems to read to you. And, and uh, if I have time, I'll read the blog posts that I put into the, the book as well. Um, here's a couple that are in process, the clock. The clock measures time in pills each day, is a glass of water, a snow flurry in April, a monster in Tokyo. We can imagine things only until tomorrow, like a willow tree that snaps in a furious storm, all sinew and hair and bone, the earth, the soil, a potter's field. Here again, the past is a fish leaping in a still pond, ripples nearly subsumed before nestling among the grass and reeds. Oh, to be a bird among men and step politely among those echoes and dream wistfully of the bird man I could become. No, to stand still as all disturbance settles, as undisturbed as the surface of the water, eyes, cloud, heart, open. In the morning, slice and marinate the beef, feed the chickens, collect the eggs, breathe softly and pet at their excited feathers. The air shimmers with the morning, the color of a pale washed sky breathing. The man groans when he sits, Grasps, gasps when he's rising. It is like a fish in the hull of a boat, the sky, the cloud, the air. What I remember, like flashes of skin, clam shacks, not a place to venture alone, the scent of life like nakedness, bivalves and crustaceans, the mind snaps shut. All the things that follow are forms of protection. The way mountains collapse into valleys and the ocean scents the air with a ripe longing. Bear interrupted. Where do you sleep undisturbed in this forest where we don't accidentally stumble into your diurnal lair? How is it at our first meeting, you do not even sniff the air before you've known, uh, you do not even sniff the air because you've known I was there all along, uh, watching from the shadows. You and I are kindred spirits, Bear, awakened in the middle of the night by a hunger and prone to gluttony. Um. <laughs> This one's called uh, Automatic Writing. Magic beans, you were the human I was meant to meet on this planet, thrown out a window, wavelength in sync, producing a tsunami, inundating the lowlands, seemingly overnight. It is there, giving this life direction and meaning beyond the ordinary confines, reaching up into the heavens, supplicant palms, I never imagined time would be a factor. Only distance, my own human fears and flailings, the fine hairs on leaf, on stalk, yearning to touch, to discover what lies higher, what lies within. This one's called uh, the reoccurring word problem. 
the reoccurring word problem, always the distance between two points, the variables of speed, momentum, time of day, what was had for dinner that night, what happens when a man who is not really a praying man kneels down to pray, the sacred stones under knee, pressed into palm, feet washed clean in river water, where are we broken and where are we healed and the stories we tell and the ones that we keep to ourselves. Uh, new ink. To have a hunger unsatiated, to live a half-life, a concubine's courtyard, an indoor cat, the sudden primal howl of a domestic dog. Look at the garden, earth undug, everywhere there is mishap, lives lost like a forgotten dollop of ice cream dropped in the street. A call and response of song. Think of a violin as a woman's voice, my father tells me. Our labor is the labor of lovers, the yard trimmed to submission for a little while. I can hear you singing as lithe legs move, a body sensuous, the perfect conduit for song, for me to call out into you and feel you respond. Um, so in addition to poetry, a lot, uh, through this pandemic, I've been writing a blog and I try and write a blog post uh, um, every work day, except I give myself a three day weekend every, every week. And so um, when Lisa asked me to write something um, uh, or, or do the blog uh, session for the conference, I, I did this piece. It's called Mountain Meditation. Hitchhiking around the Irish countryside with my backpack, I didn't have a tent but a tarp that I set up underneath my sleeping bag under the stars on clear nights when it and when it rained, I rolled myself inside like a burrito. I had a small candle lantern for light. So for the most part, when the sun went down, I went to sleep. And when the sun rose, I woke to start my day. This is the time in my life when I was most physically in tune with the planet, my circadian rhythms at one with my surroundings. I moved from landscape to landscape, primarily by bipedal locomotion. I carried a bottle, and ate mostly cheese and bread. My rhythms were like the sheep that milled about in the dawn and fell silent at dusk. That was many years ago now, but these days I find unexpected moments of connection to nature, seeing an eagle flying overhead while driving or in the creak of the soon to collapse tree strung up with vines just a little distance into the woods off the driveway, or maybe in the way the wind blows and leans against the house like a dear friend. It seems to me that honoring nature has more to do with notebooks and pens and less to do with phones and digital images. There is something insufficient in our seeking to capture the moment with video or picture, the translation into pixels, into two dimensions, the limitations of aperture, the absence of sound or smell, temperature, and the touch of leaves and spider webs. Perhaps more so during the pandemic, there is a need for the real thing, not the facsimile. Connecting with nature is mostly a solitary thing, something like meditation. But I also recognize that some of the most deeply felt moments in nature have been with a friend, a partner, who is also able to honor nature, to slow down and sit silently, to let it all soak into one's soul the way smoke permeates one's clothes until your very skin is smeared with and tastes like nature. Hiking in Glacier National Park with colleagues I met at a conference, we sat resting on an outcropping of rock extending out into Lake McDonald. The crisp spring air was too loud coming off down off the mountains to hear one another, and the wind threatened to carry us off the cliff if we were too careless. We each sat in our respective stations, staring out into the distance, feeling the stone beneath us, the curling fingers of glacial wind reaching in the seams of our jackets and touching the skin at the nape of our necks and down across our chests if we were as if we were naked and wore nothing at all. 
It was an awesome moment where we suddenly understood what it means to be alive, what it meant to share our existence together on this planet, and how insignificant our how significant our insignificance was. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you, Lise. And thanks thank everyone else who read. Thanks for sharing your story from the book. It was beautiful mm -hmm. to hear it read. Um,